Welcome, everybody. It's, uh, my guest is Rob Wagner. And I told Rob that my head has been in his book for the last 24 <laughs> hours because uh, my wife and I drove back from the beach and listened to the book. Uh, uh, we had a long drive and then uh, read it through the evening last night to make sure I'd covered the whole book before this interview this morning. And uh, this is a substantive book. So we're going to spend some time with it. But first, uh, Rob, can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your background yeah. uh, and then what the, the Kansas City Underground is before we dive in. Yeah, you bet. Uh, I've spent uh, most of my adult life uh, leading in large churches. Um, my wife and I, I was 21. She was 19. We joined this church plant in South Bend, Indiana. And we tell people we affectionately, we were a willow back church. So <laughs> willow, willow Creek and Saddleback were our mentors. And um, we were, you know, smack square in the middle of the church growth movement. And, and what was amazing though, is it, it, we were reaching people that otherwise the church wouldn't have reached. Uh, people were as lost as a ball in high weeds and they're meeting Jesus and it's changing families and marriages and and we never really intended it for it to be a mega church, but we just kept reaching people that were far from God and they brought their friends and their neighbors. And, um, and it wasn't like an overnight kind of like, woo, it just grew like 10 or 20% every year. And, uh, but it ended up being a, a really large church. Um, and, and the, the name of that church is Granger, community Granger church. community church. And Which then is- about 10 years there, uh, my role changed. I had been kind of youth pastor, young adult pastor, you know, in a church plant, you do everything. So I'd overseen children's ministry, discipleship, worship, like, and, uh, but my, my wife and I had a really deep passion for global missions as well. And so we ended up overseeing what our church was doing in the city and in the world. And we built that around a disciple making fractal, um, and really kind of grassroots with micro church as the main expression. And we got deeply involved with the disciple making movement in India that really was an, almost like a second conversion, like experiencing the church and its kind of original design. And uh, at the end of our time there, jump forward, we joined a large church here in Kansas City called Westside Family Church. And they just gave me permission to uh, experiment and play. And because basically we'd done a lot of iteration, kind of trying to discover the last five years of Granger. Um, you know, how do we kind of reboot this church around disciple making, missionary formation? How do we become decentralized? And it ended up leading to actually quite a bit of tension there. It almost um, almost felt like two churches inside of one church, yeah. you know? Um, and then when we came to Kansas City, they basically said, hey, get us into church planting internationally because they just barely dipped their toe into that. And I said, hey, and I want to do that same training here in Kansas City. And they're like, go for it. Um, and then met someone who became, you know, one of my best friends in the world, a guy named Brian Phipps, who was working on that same team and doing an amazing job with disciple making. In fact, it was one of the best examples I'd ever seen in the, in the Western church. Um, and what happened is over the five years that I served there, we saw people really start living like missionary disciple makers and making new disciples in new context. And these simple expressions of church began to emerge. And, uh, and then it became clear to us that, it would be best if we actually launched a new organization in the city. Like if it wasn't just a subset of one church and that's what launched the Kansas city underground. And we're basically a mission agency uh, in Kansas city. So our vision is to fill Kansas city with the beauty, justice, and good news of Jesus. It's a vision for gospel saturation based off of Ephesians chapter one, especially verses 22 and 23. Um, and to, to make it so that, um, every single man, woman, boy, and girl, this is our heart that they would be able to see experience and be able to respond to the gospel. Cause there's a gospel presence right in their relational network, a gospel proclamation right in their relational network, a gospel demonstration right there. And that leads to our vision, which is a missionary in every street and a micro church in every network of relationships that would actually fill the city with the gospel. It's a, yeah. um, scalable enough. You know, it's adaptable enough to fill our city. So we're organized as a mission agency to train just ordinary folks to be missionary disciple makers, to lead these simple expressions of church. And then we're also a decentralized network of missionaries and microchurches. So we organize into what we call collectives, 
for us, a collective is a network of missionaries and microchurches. That's where elders are recognized. And we want to multiply these collectives um, throughout the city so that there's a high level of support, equipping, and care, while at the same time, it's simple and scalable. And so okay. we're about two and a half years old, and it's been an amazing journey. Well, hey, let me, um, I want to lead us in prayer. I meant Thank to pray you. with you as we were going to start, because I think this is an important, for me personally, and I hope for everybody who's either watching or listening, I think this is an important conversation. So let me just uh, say a short prayer and ask God to lead us. Thank you. God, we just pray against, um, well, I want to pray against any demonic forces that would stop or hinder the conversation, because to your glory, God, we just think this is an important conversation. Amen. So would you please take it where it needs to go and bless uh, bless it to the ears of every person listening or watching. In mm -hmm. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I just want to say to everybody, uh, I felt compelled to pray because I think this conversation around this book is very important. So I've had the privilege of being a part of Exponential from the beginning. Uh, usually I do the disciple making tracks at Exponential. And then uh, with discipleship.org, there's a lot of church planting connected with disciple making, a lot of conversations. And there's a real gift that uh, Rob and his team have provided for everyone by this book. It's really kind of the state of the art in looking at uh, future expressions of disciple making and organic churches and networks. And I know that's kind of a broad description on my part. Rob, how would you describe it? If I, if I were to say, give me one or two sentences on what you're doing. It is about rediscovering the original design that Jesus had for the church, that we start with gospel planting, disciple making, that leads to what we call micro churches, simple expressions of the church that ordinary people can lead with a vision of gospel saturation in mind. How do we actually fill a city or a region uh, like the early church did and uh, for the glory of Jesus? So that's what it's about. It's about how do we kind of rediscover that original design that um, Ephesians so clearly breaks out for us. And of course, the narrative in the book of Acts. Uh, to remind everybody again, the book is called The Starfish and the Spirit. The subtitle is Unleashing the Leadership Potential of Churches and Organizations. And uh, Ori Brothman, who wrote the book The Starfish and the Spider, uh, wrote the foreword for this. It was quite interesting yeah. uh, to see he what was he a, had to say. He was and a great Rob coach for us. This, Rob wrote this with uh, Lance Ford, who is a uh, disciple-making organic church practitioner, and then Alan Hirsch, the uh, South African slash Australian uh, <laughs> missiologist, he brings his insights. Uh, the audiobook. book, um, my wife and I were listening to it, and uh, she goes, is that Alan Hirsch? And I go, no, it's just somebody who sounds like Alan Hirsch. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Alan, we, we were like, please. And he's like, no, I'm not doing the audiobook. <laughs> It'll take me he, most people don't know this, and I know he wouldn't mind me sharing this. He's dyslexic. So trying to sit and read and do some kind of audio narrative, he's like, it'll just take three months. So please hire somebody. <laughs> okay, Rob, let's start back with uh, Ori Brothman's book, The Starfish and the Spider. It came out in 2006. Before yeah. you uh, just sum it up briefly, um, in at that time, I was uh, the guy leading networks for a church planting organization called Stadia, mm -hmm. and I found that really helpful. And so, when I would train the leaders of our micro networks, I would use that book. And then, uh, Scott Thomas at the time was with Acts 29 Network, mm -hmm. so I introduced him to it, mm -hmm. and then he uh, used a lot of the principles as well with the Acts 29 Network. I don't know if you know that, but I, I wanted. I wanted to tell you about that. So uh, summarize for everybody um, what the book, The Starfish and the Spider said uh, yeah. in 2006, who Ori Brofman is, and uh, bringing him in to write the forward for, for this book that you've written. Yeah, you bet. That's, uh, it's amazing how many church leaders um, cite that book as being very influential. It's amazing. Um, 
And Ori, as he shared in the foreword, he grew up with basically uh, the greatest level of fear around two organizations. One is the military and the other is the church. And that book made huge inroads with the military and the church. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, I think there's something leading me into my fears. It's a really interesting forward. But yeah, um, very. Yeah. The, the crux of the book is this very simple but profound metaphor, a comparison between the starfish and the spider, which from a distance, they actually look kind of similar. You have a body, you've got appendages that are going out radially in different directions, uh, but they operate very differently underneath the surface. Uh, if And it's basically an example of two different types of organizations. So a spider organization, you know, if you cut the head off of a spider, you kill the organism. And spider organizations, by extension, there are standard hierarchies where there's typically a centralized brain or decision-making body that regulates the actions in a very centralized, direct fashion. So in most churches, there is, um, many of them function in that sort of spider form. There's either a lead pastor or an executive team. There's a small number of people that hold actually almost all the power, the majority of the power. Um, and it looks very strong, um, but, it, but it's actually very fragile. You know, so a great example from a few years ago, and I share this with a broken heart, but be like Mark Driscoll and the Mars Hill Network. I mean, in one moment, it looks like one of the greatest successes in the church in America. And three months later, it's gone. Yeah. You know, and it was because it was a spider hierarchy built around Mark and a handful of people. And when, you know, the accusations of coercive kind of bullying and tactics came out, it folded, you know, overnight. Whereas the starfish... Uh, Again, if you if you cut off what looked like was maybe the head of the starfish, you end up with two starfish. <laughs> they don't they don't have that same problem. If you cut a starfish in half, it, it actually has everything needed within it to reproduce the whole because it's actually operating as a neural network and the intelligence and the power is distributed through the entire starfish. And we make a case that that is actually in the New Testament church, um, that it, it operates as a starfish organization. And that's what's interesting about Ori. You know, he's a tenured professor at Berkeley, which is kind of a bastion for human secularism in the story yeah. of America. But he's an honest academic, you know. And he would he would tell you if you study history, um, when he wrote this book about kind of this empowering, equipping, decentralized form of leadership that's trying to get everybody to their maximum level of influence. Well, the church is the first breakout story in history of that type of leadership and it finds its origin in the person of Jesus. And so there's so many books for church leaders, but what, what I've discovered is underneath the surface, the paradigm for a lot of that is actually centralized leadership. Yes. And so we're trying to create a book on decentralized leadership and don't get me wrong. I, there's skills that you learn in centralized leadership most of those you still need in decentralized leadership. Yes. Like if you can't communicate, if you can't cast a vision, if you don't understand the 21 laws of leadership, like that's all legit. But there's actually also another set of skills in decentralized leadership that most church leaders have never been taught. They didn't learn it in seminary. Um, their denominational heritage didn't pass it on to them. And so we're hoping to really make it practical for church leaders to rediscover that skill set and practice it. Yeah, I just think you guys... Uh, do a really good job in uh, uh, laying out a vision of a decentralized network uh, of, uh, like like you said, of uh, micro churches working together. And uh, um, in fact, I like so much and I respect so much the work you've done. I'm like, I want to argue with you about some of these things just just in the sense so that I can tease it out and learn from you. Because I don't know of a book like this right now Thank you. that is so exhaustive in describing, here's what we do, here's why we do it, here's how it all works together, here's our disciple-making strategies. Um, I mean, Rob, uh, it really is a significant book. Thank really you, grateful to you guys for the work. This would have been a lot of work, and uh, it really shows. And I'll just say to everybody... If you want a substantive investigation of where some of the brightest minds right now 
in church planting are uh, in terms of the connection between disciple making and church planting. Uh, and you want to look at where the future may be going. I can't think of a better book wow. to get that you to so start much. with in this one. It means a so, lot coming from you. And well, I, and well, a lot of people don't know, you know, basically more than half the book is just on disciple making. Yeah. You yeah. Know? That's the one thing about it that, like you said, you wouldn't know. In fact, you come up with a new term. So we at uh, discipleship.org, we talk about disciple making movements. There's around 1400 disciple making movements in the world. And all that. You come up with a, at least for the first time I'd heard it, a movement of disciple making. And I'm like, Ooh, I love that. <laughs> uh, is that original with you guys? It is. Yeah. And it, it, it came out of, I'm going to steal it. No, that's why we're there. We're, we're hoping it becomes a technical term that the church in the West adopts because our, basically from 20 years of like experiments, failures, iteration, repentance, like we basically discovered, hey, there's two different mobilization pathways for disciple yeah. making. You know, and one of them is the DMM strategy. It's kind of that pure strategy that you see in the New Testament. And then in places like Africa, India, but where you have like a Christendom and a cultural Christianity in the heritage, which yeah. you're going to have in America, or you're going to have in Western Europe. There's another form of disciple making, which is also present in the New Testament, but it's a it's kind of hidden. Yeah. Um, and and the whole idea is basically disciple making movements. Um, we want to honor the 40 years of work that's been done by people like Garrison and Watson and so forth. And, Sh and Shadake Johnson's a real regular with uh, discipleship.org and, and Jerry right. Trousdale, you, you refer to yes. Jerry's yeah, Jerry's work and, so and, and that. So uh, uh, Rob, one of the things you do really well, and I have to commend you again, is that uh, you honor the past. You, you, the great thing about you um, being at the center of this book is your experience with the mega church. In fact, you know, some model mega churches that are really looked up to and respected and you honor the leaders, and you honor that. In fact, you honor the current mega church, but you're also saying this is something that we think has a lot of merit to it, and uh, in some ways is more biblical. And so we're moving after this hard. And I think you've done a really good job in that. And so it's not like somebody's mad at the mega church, <laughs> it, it, and and a lot of people are today. And it's it's like. No, you're, you're just trying to, um, you're trying to guide with substance out of what you've learned. Amen. And well, I, think, I, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for my journey through the mega church. Like I, I think what was powerful about the church growth movement is it took um, like a missional theology and an incarnational theology and tried to bring it back to a Christendom form of the church. So it's yes. like, we have to have an external focus. We have to be a church for the unchurch, you know, yeah. and then there was that incarnational impetus of, hey, we need to be culturally relevant. Like we, we have to bridge that cultural gap. We can't ask the unbeliever to do that. They're not supposed to be the missionary. We are, yeah. you know, but it did, it never messed with um, the ecclesiology. We basically left the Christendom template of like church as a building with professionals and programs. The other thing the church growth movement didn't touch at all was the whole call to disciple making. Yeah. Um, and so you know, it did originally, you know, I, uh, I worked on, did my uh, uh, doctor minister under Tom Rayner and originally it started that way with uh, Donald McGavern and those guys, mm. but it just, it seemed to lose the, lose its way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I hear you. You're right. And there was, there was definitely attempts along the way. Yeah. Um, but that form of church, I think does have some, um, I, I guess, gravitational pool away yeah. from disciple making. Yeah, no, no. I think that you're right. It ends up being more about um, how to how to do the program church better mm -hmm. and, and to trust programs to disciple people. So, Rob, um, I'm conscious of our time because there's so much to get, get into here. Let me uh, start by just, if you could describe, if I were to come to Kansas City, Mm -hmm. And I were to follow you around uh, for a week or two. Yep. Show me the rhythms of this church uh, model that that uh, you and Brian Phipps have uh, worked so hard to develop. 
explain if I as if I didn't know anything. Yeah. There's this DNA you've told me about, like the starfish, if you cut it up, um, the starfish that you cut off would regenerate. Mm -hmm. So there's this DNA around organic relationships. Mm -hmm. And what does it look like? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, when people tell us like, um, hey, I want to, can I come and just, you know, uh, like drop into a microchurch, you know, and, and I explain to them, if you really want to understand it, uh, your question is very insightful. It's like, you'd have to come and spend a week or two with me. Yeah. Because it's not about a meeting. Yeah. Do we have meetings? Yeah, actually, a lot of them. <laughs> but it's about an extended spiritual family. So I'll just use this week, for example. You know, so Sunday, um, our microchurch family, which has now um, been growing in our neighborhood um, for really about four years. It was about 18 months of missionary work of Michelle and I just getting to know people's names and then praying for them by name and doing prayer walks and, and learning to listen, starting with a posture of curiosity, like understanding people's stories, understanding the story of our neighborhood and learning kind of the rhythms of our neighborhood. Like, Oh, if you go to the mailbox at a certain time, you're going to run into three or four people or a bunch of people walk their dogs at the schoolyard behind the house after dinner. So if we walk our dogs, then we're going to connect with them and then um, inviting people into the hospitality of our home and our life. Like, Hey, let's watch the Royals together. Let's, Hey, come on over. Let's uh, have dessert, you know, or smoke a cigar together or whatever, you know? And then as we begin in prayer, listen and engage, eat, we find ways to serve people. That's really meaningful. And then what happened is 18 months of living those rhythms. We had our first spiritual conversation with one of our neighbors and she gave her life to Jesus at our kitchen table. About three weeks later, she shared her story with another neighbor who I didn't know because he was three blocks down, but he was actually suicidal. He gave his life to Jesus three weeks after that. And it started this kind of spiritual chain reaction where we now have, um, you know, there's nine families that are in our micro church. We're following Jesus together. It's changed the whole culture of our neighborhood. So that extended spiritual family, like we, we had a Memorial day party and uh, we had, I think four, four or five new families that came just to be a part of it. And it's a potluck and I grilled eight zillion pork chops, you know, <laughs> and, um, and we had two, two and a half hours of just genuine community. This, this family that's been here, maybe two weeks, they came and they're saying, this neighborhood is like amazing. Like, it, uh, like it, people, it's like, you're all doing life together and you're, they can feel the gospel presence. That's what they're saying. Yeah. Like, this is not a normal neighborhood. Something's yeah. different here. And they want to be at the party, you know, they want to be with these strangers because they're like, there's something here that we're drawn to, you know, and then, um, you know, after that, we had a uh, drive in driveway drive in. So everybody, you know, pulled up their chairs, we watched a movie together. Um, and then our, our micro church family, um, there were some things that came up um, yesterday, one of the families had a huge blowout with their immediate family. Um, and they reach out to us first, you know, they're going to reach out to their microchurch family and say, man, we had a blow up and we're hurt and we're processing that with them. Like, how do you forgive? How do you, forgiveness doesn't mean you allow abusive behavior to continue. So let's talk about boundaries, you know, um, we will meet tomorrow night and we're going to gather around a meal and we're going to gather around the scriptures. We're going to gather around prayer and planning for mission. So we're, because we've had two or three issues in our microchurch family with um, blood relations, where there's been a lot of conflict and unforgiveness, we're going into passages on what Jesus says about forgiveness, right? And we're going to see what the scripture says and live under the authority of the scripture. And we always end our, our Bible studies with I will statements, like how will I obey this? Because Jesus said, teach to obey, you know, and also who can I share this with? Um, because we're supposed to all make disciples. And then we'll pray together and we'll plan for mission. So planning for mission is as simple as how can we serve? So who do we, and I already know what it's going to be. One of our neighbors is having a surgery. So we need to take care of that family doing probably a meal plan and some other things. And then what's our next party? Because Jesus loves to do parties and bring the better wine, you know? <laughs> um, and at the end of this party, people are already asking when's the next party. <laughs> So it'll probably be the 4th of July because that's about four weeks out. We'll start planning that together. And then, um, and then Thursday, uh, I have a, 
a triad of guys within my micro and we go deeper. It's the transparent space. It's a higher level of accountability, higher level of support. And we also prayer walk together, you know, so we're going to pray for our neighborhood, pray for every family to be able to respond to Jesus. And, uh, and then like next Sunday, we have what we call an equipping gathering. And so the equipping gathering is training for all the disciple makers and the microchurch leaders that are in the Kansas city underground. And so it'll be microchurch leaders from all over the city. Um, but we have five people now in our microchurch that have actually signed the missionary commitment. So they've come to Christ. They're owning the mission with us. They want to be disciple makers. Um, those people gather on Sundays from four to five 30. And we are working through something we call the missionary pathway. So it's five phases of training uh, in a missionary journey. Jesus went through this journey. The early church went through this journey, disciple making movements. So for example, last two and a half months, we've been training in extraordinary prayer and fasting this week. We're actually shifting to live as a missionary. So, uh, because it's time to start having parties again, this week is going to be training on hospitality and how to throw parties. And Hugh Halter is going to come because oh, he's wow. like the king of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and he's got a great little book called happy hour that we'll have available for all the missionaries you know um and then like we have an apostolic equipping team and it's we call that our there's a hub and the hub is an equipping team that supports all the missionaries the micro churches next monday that equipping team will meet monday morning and we're planning and we're training on how do we continue to equip and to coach all the missionaries and micro churches in the city um and then there's all the touches in between of like running into our neighbors again at the mailbox on text. Like I was in a text stream yesterday with a family that's been in our microchurch maybe four or five months. And she brought her mother and her father and her aunt and her uncle to the party. And then all yesterday afternoon, her dad had questions. They were having spiritual conversations. She's texting me the whole time. <laughs> you know, like, wow. um, so that's what it looks like, except that's being reproduced in neighborhoods and networks all over the city. Like we have seven collectives of micro churches. So imagine that happening on a bunch of different blocks or different affinity groups. Um, and to us, it's like, I, I feel like we're living into that. The story you see in the new Testament, it's like, this is, this is it. Like this is, and it, it's amazing. You know, it's super costly. It's very hard. Um, but the joy and the power that we're experiencing of the gospel really transforming lives. And we're beginning to see multiplication. You know, it's nothing yeah. like what we're seeing in India, but yeah. like we've had a 1200% increase in micro churches in the last two years. It's like, wow, That's I've never lot. seen so, that before. So, and we're not a big deal. We're not a big deal. We're really not. No, There's no, 36 no, micro churches. We what I appreciate is you're, you're, you're willing to be vulnerable and talk about it. And, and then the rest of us can, can learn with you by looking at all these things. So Rob, right now, uh, how many micro churches do you guys have? We're at, we're at 36 micro churches. That's and we have a lot. And, and typically there's what, uh, I think in the book you said like 16 people in a micro, what's the average yeah, size? I was using that. That is the data from 2414. And they, they're like the best organization measuring disciple making movements. Yeah. So the, the average size church in the disciple making movements is 16. And I think that pretty well correlates with what we're experiencing. We have some micro churches that are much bigger than that. We have a few that are smaller than that. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting about the micro church is it's very porous, like that the margins. So like at a party, you might have 75 people show up. Like, yeah. And, and they might not say I'm in the micro church, but in my mind, it's like, we're actually making disciples of these people. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You're discipling them by, by just the way Jesus did it, which is relationships. Right, and it's like you disciple to conversion. Like discipleship starts before conversion. To that's and exactly conversion. right. No, that that, that. when you so when like Jesus our neighbors that, model, that have right? met Jesus, most of them it started with conversations about like parenting, finances, yes. or they're having a problem with their neighbor, and they're like, "This guy's driving me crazy. I don't know what to do." But <laughs> yeah. Know? And it, and then you're sharing that we have Jesus with them. And they're and like Jesus said, if you try what I'm doing, you'll see I was sent from God. <laughs> yeah. You know, and they start experiencing the, the life of Jesus. And then there is a moment that we, you know, you ask people to cross the line and we're, you know, we count baptisms. We, you know, it's like that stuff's not out the window, you know, but 
we don't count attendance of microchurches. Like we're counting the number of missionaries, the number of microchurches, the number of hubs, number of discovery Bible studies, those kind of things, you know? Yeah. No. And, and for those uh, joining in, uh, uh, Brian Phipps is a partner with Rob and I've got to say, they've really thought this thing through and they map it out in the book. I'm really grateful for the way you map it out. And it's, it, there's a lot of substance in this. The, far more than I thought. Like I read the book, The Starfish and the Spider. It was a quick read. Yeah. I, when I got the book, I thought, yeah, it'll be a quick read. No, it's not a quick read because there's so much substance. Yeah, we uh, wanted the, there to be a very firm theological and philosophical foundation. Like our orthopraxy has to be grounded in orthodoxy. You yeah. Know? And we, you know, the, it took us five years to write the book, man. I believe it. I believe it because it's got that much depth to it. Talk to us, uh, Rob, about your uh, disciple making strategy. And then I want to talk a little bit about discovery Bible study. Okay. But first talk to us about um, as you envision disciple making and your disciple making strategy that you talk about in the book. Yeah, you bet. Well, the book is actually a series of seven starfish and each one of them deal with like a key big idea or principle. And the two most important ones are actually the second half of the book. That's right. And, and one of them is called the <clears throat> disciple. Uh, it's the starfish for disciple making ingredients, the ingredients of a disciple making environment. And then the other one is the elements of a disciple making ecosystem. So if you think about, I'll start with that second one, like every um, faith community is an ecosystem. And if an ecosystem has the right elements and balance, then organisms live and reproduce and it's healthy. Yeah. And, and so unfortunately, a lot of faith communities are kind of discipleship averse and yeah. they don't know why. Um, so what we're trying to get at is what are, the, what are the essential elements you need in your ecosystem as a faith community so that it's actually conducive to disciples both being transformed and multiplied? And we look at five different elements um, and it's, we try to, we all, we try to like put the cookies on the bottom shelf without compromising the content. So it's yeah. five V's it's alliterated. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the first V is voice. In other words, um, I mean, vision is vision. So you have to have a definition of what a disciple is. What is your vision for a disciple? That was so good when I'm reading through that, I'm going, this is so good. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> Yeah, because you, you're, if you don't know what you're shooting for, you're not going to make one, you know. And then um, secondly is voice. In other words, once you have an idea what a disciple is, you have to get in the game. Like you have to ask who's listening, who's ready. And like Jesus, uh, it's a high bar invitation. You know, like a lot of disciple making programs were like announcing it on the weekend. Who wants to get in the disciple making program? That isn't how Jesus did it. He did it relationally. He went to people one-on-one. -on -one. He said, I want you to follow me. Yeah. I want you to leave your nets. And we're doing life differently. And I'm going to invest in you. And so we challenge church leaders, like, you have to find your 12. You have to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to show you who they are. And then you invite them with that kind of high challenge invite and also that high investment promise. Like, we're going to do life together. Then next, you need a vocabulary. So you need a disciple making vocabulary, which means you need to have language and tools, you know, so language creates culture. You need a disciple making lexicon. Yes. It's very important. Yeah. And then you need to have practical tools that are simple, that people can um, learn quickly and also teach others because yeah. every disciple needs to be a disciple can make disciples. So you, yes. it's like any apprenticeship. You got to give them simple language and simple tools. And then you need vehicles. That's the fourth part. In other words, what are your relational environments? Yeah. In your guy's book, Discipleship That Fits, I hope you saw how influential it's been on us. You know, well, that, was, that was humbling and encouraging. Well, the, the, for us, your guys work on those different relational spaces and you need the divine space. So people need to learn how to spend time alone with the father every day to find their identity and destiny. You have to have that transparent space with your triad. You need the 12 the personal space, you need the 72, which is the social space. And then yeah. you need to be engaged in the, the harvest field with the crowds. And then the last part is voyage. In other words, there's a journey and there's different stages. And I try to provide four or five, six different examples of what those look like. 
Yeah. Um, and so people need to have the right content at the right time, but it's on the job training, you know, yeah. and as you develop. And so we're trying to give a simple framework for a church leader to go, how are you doing with those five elements? Do you have clarity on those? Uh, yeah. How are you doing at balancing those? And then the other, the other disciple making starfish is the ingredients of an intentional disciple making environment. And this hit, this comes under kind of the vehicles part. Yeah. Like, okay, if you have a relational environment, yeah. what are the ingredients you have to put into it so that it actually makes disciples? Because we've yeah. all had relational environments like a small group and they don't make disciples. Yeah, that's right. So like, what are the ingredients you put in? And we talk about five and they're very simple. First of all, it's outcome focused and it needs to be focused on the spirit's outcomes. It's yeah. the spirit of God that is applying sanctification to our lives. By the Paul way- talks- I've got to also say you guys do a great job in showing how it's all undergirded by fasting and prayer. Amen. And uh, like, I just thought to myself, I'm, I'm, I was, I was so often I hear strategies and methodologies and it's like, you know, we add on prayer afterwards, but that's not what you guys are doing at all. And uh, just really thought it was good. Anyway, keep going, Rob. Yeah, no, I just want to underscore that. Like what, again, disciple making lexicon one of the things we say a lot is prayer is the work yeah prayer is the strategy Ooh. begin in prayer we say this all the time nobody skips the upper room (laughs) that's good that's where it begins and that's where it continues and in fact if you look at the book of acts there's this like cycle um where it's extraordinary prayer and fasting, live as a missionary, plant the gospel, microchurches emerge, multiplication, and then there's some kind of conflict and opposition. Yeah. And uh, what does it trigger? Extraordinary prayer and fasting. There you go. And you're back at it again. So we're trying to teach our missionaries, get ready for opposition, get ready for conflict, and let it trigger extraordinary prayer and fasting. Be filled again with the Holy Spirit. Constantly be being filled, you know? So yeah, those five ingredients, we're going to focus on the fruit of the spirit, and the gifts of the spirit, that those are the spirit's outcomes, character and calling. The second ingredient is, is very key. It's habit fueled. So we're learning a way of life. The church was called the way because it was the way of life and the way of Jesus. So we have to learn the rhythms and the habits of Jesus, but we're doing that not as an end in and of themselves. We're doing that with a focus on the spirit's outcomes. Am I growing in character and calling? Am I becoming more like Jesus? Am I more deeply engaged in his mission? The third piece then is what we call mission fixated. So the context for disciple making is mission. So have I identified where I've been sent and who I'm sent to? Then also it's community forged, which we're back to the one, the three, the 12, the 72. And then lastly, we say it's content flavored. And the reason we put that last is for the church in America, we have been content codependent. Yeah. A disciple making has been all about the data dump. If we can just get people the right information, then they'll be discipled. And no church in the history of the church has had better content or more content and had a, done a worse job of making disciples. Yeah. So our whole point is the content is important. Um, but if it's not in the context of, all those other elements, it, it doesn't actually bring transformation. And so the content, number one, is the gospel. So the gospel has to flavor everything. And then secondly, people need the right content at the right time based off of where they're at in terms of their spiritual journey. So those two stars, um, starfish, give a simple framework for a church leader to go, okay, how am I doing with these five elements? Are these actually in play in my church? Mm -hmm. And then when I'm designing an intentional disciple making environment, do I have all five of these elements and do I have them balanced properly? Uh, Part of what you use in terms of the content is, uh, you know, kind of the root and the fruit of behavior, um, which is uh, uh, Jeff Vanderstelt esque stuff. Talk to us about that because that I, I thought again, good job on that. Well, man, I just want to pass on the props to Tim Chester and Jeff Vanderstelt. You know, our our journey has been one where um, you're going to see a lot of people's fingerprints in this book. You know, and Soma and the work they've done with gospel fluency has been profoundly uh, important to us because the gospel, the whole idea there is 
the gospel is not just as Tim Keller says, the ABCs, it's the A to Z yeah. of the Christian faith and that we never stop evangelizing ourselves because yeah. evangelism is taking the good news of Jesus and applying it to every area of life. Yes. And fundamentally being a disciple is moving from unbelief to belief in Jesus in every area of life. And the gospel speaks to that. So the gospel is what heals my warped image of God. The gospel is what heals my warped self image. The gospel is the pure fuel and motivation for change where I'm, I'm ceasing from my striving, my earning, my arrogance, and I'm working from a place of rest. So gospel fluency, the tool set that um, it started with Tim Chester and then Jeff built on it is basically a simple set of tools. One of them is called uh, fruit to root. So the idea is you look at the fruit of your life and let's say I'm, I was doing this this morning in my time with Jesus. There's something I was anxious about and depressed about actually. And I have to ask the Lord, okay, let's go down the tree from the fruit of anxiety and depression. And you begin to ask yourself, okay, um, what, what lies am I believing about my identity? You know, and in this particular area it was like, I am my performance in this particular area of my life. And I feel like I'm failing and it's super important to me. So now it's like an existential crisis of like, I'm, I'm a total failure kind of thing. It's like, Oh, that's bad. <laughs> like now let's go down a level deeper. Then what am I believing about God? Cause my identity is based on the nature of God and who I think he is. So it's like, well, I'm, I guess I'm believing that, um, that God looks at me and he's sort of like an Olympic judge. And he's rating me on my performance, which is a horrible image of God. <laughs> and also, I kind of feel like he's powerless, like I'm out here alone in this situation. <clears throat> so I'm, it's like I'm believing lies about him being powerless or absent. You know, now you're all the way down at the bottom. Wow, that's so good. And then you start confessing it. Like you're doing the work of confession. It's like, Lord, I believe in these lies about you, that you're present. I proclaim that you are present. Like, you said, lo, you'd be with me always, even to the end of the age. And I'm a, I'm a temple of your spirit. Like you start repenting out loud. And I am not what I do. Like I am who you say I am. I am the beloved son of God on whom your favor rests. And now you're going now from the root back up, right? And you're, you're repenting by confessing, like, who is God? What does the scripture tell me? The gospel tell me, who am I? And then what happens is I could, like within 30 minutes, it was like my joy was coming back up my, my peace, you know, a sense of a, like, Oh, I can hear from the spirit now. Cause I'm not caught up in all this condemnation. Like, Lord, what do you want me to do next? And I got a very clear prompting about what to do next. And it's like, okay, I can do that. You know? So we really are committed to teaching every missionary, those gospel fluency skills. Cause if, when you begin to learn how to speak the gospel to yourself, to your own idolatry, then you learn, you're not trying to make a presentation with people anymore. Like you're looking at your neighbor or your coworker and you're going, oh, they think they're, they're their job title and that their bank account is their security and their boss is their God. And you're not doing it in an arrogant way. You're doing it right. in solidarity with them because you're like, I know what my stuff is. Yeah, that's right. That, that's exactly right. But now you know how to bring the good news to them. You know, you're not just asking them, do you know where you go if you die tonight? Like you're your understanding it's like oh they're trapped in this prison of performance and now i can bring the good news that it's like jesus finished work you can stop striving man yeah. you can know who you are and you don't have to live in this tyranny of like what your boss thinks of you anymore so so the good thing about what you're talking about is the specificity of what um being a disciple is like as you're sharing yourself and also making disciples it's really helping people form their lives around Jesus and, and the fullness that he brings us. Rob, if we can, let's um, talk about Discovery Bible Study. A couple of weeks ago, you and I were in Austin with uh, Exponential Ventures. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I was trying to press somebody on uh, DBS, Discovery Bible Study. And uh, um, you leaned over to me and Talk to me about how they'd been going well uh, there with you guys. So tell us uh, just uh, again for our audience, what is Discovery Bible Study 
how are you using them as a disciple making tool and uh, tell us how it's going. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Well, Discovery Bible Study is a simple form of Bible engagement that has a multiplicative disciple making DNA baked into it. And so um, really quick overview, you read, you go right to the scripture, there is no external curriculum. Um, the, the Holy Spirit and the community is the teacher. So you don't have like a professional teacher. It's not lecture based, it's discovery based. Um, and then it's also obedience based. So you're working through this discovery process in this passage to discover who, who God is and then what it would mean to follow and obey. And then you write an I will statement, which is a simple statement of um, whatever the Holy Spirit highlighted, how you live into it. And yeah. then also who you'll share it with. So basically you read the passage a couple of times. You have somebody retell it in their own words. And then you ask a simple set of questions. What does this tell us about the character and nature of God? What does it tell us about kind of the um, people in general, like our character, our nature? What is it saying to me specifically? And then what am I going to do about it? And then you write that will statement. You share that. Um, typically, when you meet the next time, that's what you start with. How did it go with the I will statements? What and you words? have people literally write it down. You know, what's interesting, brother, like in our Disciples Made app, yeah. it's all digital. So when you put it in there, everybody in my triad and my 12 sees my I will statement. <laughs> so okay, built so in that, if, if I want to look at that app and I'm listening in, that's Disciples Made. Yep, disciplesmade.com. And uh, so it's basically, it's an app where you can practice these spiritual habits in community online and it provides support and accountability. So I'm reading a passage of scripture. I write my I will statement. Let's say I'm in Ephesians and it's like, oh, I exasperated my daughter. I know I did. And I need to ask her forgiveness. My three guys are going to see that and they're going to pray for me and they're going to ask me, how did it go? That's you so know? good. Yeah, so um, so Discovery Bible Study, we we have these five phases of training I mentioned. First one is extraordinary prayer and fasting. Phase two is live as a missionary. Phase three is plant the gospel. Phase four is microchurch emerges. Phase five is multiplication. So in plant the gospel, we basically teach people the gospel fluency skills we were just talking about, and then also how to lead and multiply Discovery Bible Studies. So typically, this is very common in the underground. This is how almost all of our microchurches have emerged. You get a missionary um, pair or a team, and they start in prayer and fasting. They're praying for their context. They start living as a missionary, um, simple incarnational rhythms. And depending on the context, sometimes it goes quick, sometimes it goes slow. They start having spiritual conversations. And we typically say to people, hey, once you've had like two spiritual conversations, invite them to do a discovery Bible study because they're giving you a green light, you know. So yeah. basically what our missionaries will do is we'll say, um, hey, would you like to just look directly at what Jesus had to say? I'm not going to preach at you. We're not going to watch some weird video. <laughs> like we're going to actually read the words of Jesus for ourselves, have a conversation to discover what it would mean to follow him. Um, and then they meet for a discovery Bible study. and what happens is most of the time, not always, but more often than not, people are like, can we keep doing this? Mm. It's like, yeah, yeah, we can. We had a couple, for example, that they, they're in Gardner and kind of a middle, upper middle class neighborhood. It, they were in phase one and phase two for two years in their neighborhood, mm. like praying, fasting, trying to live as a missionary, no spiritual conversations, Mike and, and, Kristen, or their name, Christine, actually. And Mike said one time he tried to like crowbar Jesus into something and his neighbors were like, whoa, whoa, back up the train, bro. You know, but, you know, they're, she likes to read. So she started a book club. He's into mixed martial arts. So, so are some of the other guys, they're watching the fights together, you know, barbecuing and all that stuff. Well, I don't know, maybe four or five months ago, um, in one week, they had like, powerful spiritual conversations with two different sets of neighbors both of them they invited to do a discovery bible study and they both said yes mm. you know and he said you know that first discovery bible study with one of those couples um they actually did the lord's prayer which was really interesting yeah um and they had an amazing catalytic conversation 
And he said he forgot to ask them at the end of the time if they wanted to meet again next week. And he was like, oh, man, I forgot. And then he was nervous. He's like, I don't know if, like, they kind of pushed back before when I pushed too hard. Maybe I shouldn't say. And he said, you know, a few days later, his buddy texted him. And he's like, man, I've been telling everybody about that. He called it the Zen Bible <laughs> prayer time. He's like, I felt so much peace after we did that thing. And then I just, and he was like, I've been telling everyone, God wants a relationship with you, not religion. Like, from one discovery Bible study, you know? And he's like, can we meet again? So they started meeting weekly. And what happens is through that discovery Bible study, new disciples emerge. Like people yeah. start actually engaging the Bible. They start obeying Jesus. They're in community. And what we've seen happen over and over again is a microchurch, like the discovery Bible study becomes a womb for a new microchurch. Wow. And we've seen it work in cell blocks and in suburban neighborhoods, both. Like we've, since we've started, we're like two years, three months old, the Kansas City Underground. More than yeah. 150 discovery Bible studies have been started. Really? Yeah. And it and most of that is what's led to all of our baptisms and all of our micro churches. So in our context, it's been very effective. But what I find is there's a lot of church leaders that take discovery Bible study and rather than use it in the harvest where we're using it, yes. they're trying to use it in the church world. Yes. And it doesn't work. Yes. And it doesn't really lead to transformation or multiplication. Because it wasn't designed for that setting. That's good. Will you uh, explain what you mean by that? Like um, how it works with non-believers or people trying to figure out what they believe. So the harvest field is, uh, I guess you've already said it. I'm, I'm about to ask you. Well, that. it's back to what you started about. There's disciple making movements. The goal of those penetrate lostness. Uh, it's to see new disciples, four generations deep and multiple strands. By God's grace, new churches will emerge out of that. Movements of disciple making, um, you still have the same goals. You want it to be viral, multiplicative, four generations, multiple strands. Um, but it's a slower build. Yes. You're starting with the church in a Christendom and Christian subculture. Yes. It's like Jesus with his 12 good religious boys. Yes. Yes. Like, He's got to deconstruct their image of God, their understanding of the scriptures, what the mission of God is, how to interact with the other. Like they, it took three years. And even then you and I both know, like their, their theological furniture was still all jacked up. It wasn't yeah, like yeah. arranged correctly, you know? Um, and so when you're working with the church, you're working with people that um, there's a lot of unlearning that needs to be done. And that's why um, we have kind of this continuum of tools and we have what we call informal tools that you use in the harvest with the lost things like the blessed rhythms, discovery Bible study. Um, but then in the church world, uh, we have more formal tools. So for example, we've got um, an experience that's called followers made and it's designed to take a believer and help them become a disciple maker. Mm. And it's it takes six months of doing intentional deconstruction and reconstruction. So what I'm trying to say is if you haven't done that kind of deconstruction work and just throw Discovery Bible study at Christians in a Christian subculture, um, they're so used to um, lecture-based. Yes. They're so used to like content-based, not obedience-based kind of stuff that it, if you haven't done the deconstructing work, it sort of just bounces off of them. Yeah. Cause it's like, well, this is trite. Like, where's the, where's the meat? Where's the teaching? And then like, they don't like the, I will statement. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like you're trying to tell, wait a second. <laughs> They're so used to just like getting content and not having to do anything with it. So they don't actually write an, I will statement, or if they do, they don't like do anything with it. And then you say, share it. And they're kind of like, Hmm. So what happens is they don't actually do a discovery Bible study. They do some weird half breed of it. And yeah. then three weeks later, they're like, Hey, can we go back to the video curriculum? Yeah. <laughs> That's boy. I'm, the way you describe that is so good, Rob. Well, I've experienced both ways, man. You know, I've been made a lot of mistakes. So a lot of it is just sharing out of like, well, I tried that and it didn't work. Why did this not work? Yeah. <laughs> So, oh, that's, again, so much substance here. Rob, if I'm watching or listening and I want to find out more about what you guys do, I can go to disciplesmade.com. 
Yeah. And that focuses on helping prevailing model churches actually get movements of disciple making going. Um, and so we have four different intentional disciple making environments. So I mentioned followers made. We have another one called leaders made, missionaries made, micro church learning community. It's about three years of of a disciple making journey, which is what Jesus we did. It's funny. We didn't actually try to get it to be three years. We kind of built these incrementally. And at the yeah. end, it was like, do you realize we ended up with a three year journey? <laughs> <That was not funny. laughs> it felt like Jesus was winking at us on that. Um, and then we help churches kind of create uh, that disciple making ecosystem. If you want to learn more about what we're doing in terms of decentralized leadership, micro churches, you can go to kansascityunderground.org. Um, and there's a ton of free resources there. And then if you want to um, get more information about the book, you can go to the, the uh, starfishandthespirit.com. And we also have a podcast. It's the Starfish and the Church. Oh, that's great. Well, um, we've just got a few minutes left here. I appreciate you uh, giving those resources. I want to recommend them to everyone. I think that you guys have, uh, you're really, uh, I feel like on the leading edge uh, for people to look at. Uh, Rob, if you were to point to others like the underground, um, uh, Tampa Underground with Brian Sanders, uh, how are you guys different from what they're doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we are in the underground network and they're our family and we stand on their shoulders. Um, they've been great coaches and mentors to us. A couple of the distinctives, um, they would have kind of a stronger emphasis, I think, on like social justice and addressing those issues, you know, with a kind of a strong prophetic presence and voice. Our starting point is disciple making. Um we're kind of obsessed with that. Yeah. A second thing is um, we have a really high value on multiplication. So Tampa, you know, they've been going almost 12, 13 years, and they have one hub that serves their whole city. Yeah. Our vision is to have maybe 30 hubs in our city. So we're doing like a smaller, lighter weight version of the hub. Yeah. And it's really about having an equipping team that gets multiplied in different places around the city. So every missionary microchurch will have an equipping team that's there to serve them and they're part of the city. So those are the two distinctives. Like we're, um, the emphasis on disciple making and multiplication. Um, and they're, uh, you know, we feel like we're first followers, you know? Um, yeah. Like we couldn't be where we are without their work. Um, but I feel like God's given us a grace to sort of translate it um, in a way that, uh, well, you mentioned it, like in a way that maybe feels like there's a sense of honor with the prevailing church. Like we're yeah. not, we are for every expression of the church, yeah. but we're not going to pull any punches either. Yeah. No, you did a great job uh, in the book of that. You didn't pull any punches, but you were honoring at the same time. And I, I thought that was really, uh, really healthy. Uh, I hope we get a more conversations about uh, about what you're doing, about the uh, uh, the presentation, the biblical arguments uh, that you're making, I think it would be really healthy conversation because I do think that for a lot of our listeners, uh, what you guys are doing is really noteworthy and and uh, will really help with the the conversation nationally. In fact, um, the whole concept of movements of disciple making. I love that. I love the way you guys capture that in a language. Uh, I want to also champion that and you, uh, help move the conversation forward. Well, Rob, God bless you. Thank you Thank so you. much for what you're doing. And uh, I just want to encourage everybody who's joined with us live that next week, uh, Brandon Ginden with Disciple Making Culture. We're going to keep up this conversation about being disciples who make disciples. There's no greater mission on planet Earth Amen. than to be disciples who are committed to making disciples. So God bless you, Rob. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, brother. And uh, your affirmation means a lot. Thank you. And by the way, if you've not read Bobby's newest book, you need to. It's the greatest primer I've seen to help a local church kickstart the conversation about what disciple making actually is. So oh, thanks for that.